very neat and strong correlation between latitudes and uh, the average daily light integral uh, in that month, right? So you can take the DLIs of uh, the sunny days and the non-sunny days and you average that for all the days you have measured it in, uh, in December. And then these are basically the, uh, the different observations. Well, that's uh, clear and they go to up to say 20, 25 when you come close to the tropics. But in summer, of course, it's quite different. In summer, you will see that uh, the light intensity is much higher and it can go up to uh, values of 60 moles per square meter per day when you are, for example, in the Negev desert, or it can be as low as uh, 25 or 30 moles per square meter per day if you are in Tokyo, where there is the wet season at this moment. But by and large, you see that there is a relationship with latitude, but the relationship is far less clear than in, in December. And actually, if you would try to plot a uh, linear relationship, there is no significant uh, slope. And you could say that differences between different latitudes are pretty small. Now, and to give you the perspective about what that means, I go back to an uh, experiment uh, from Monteith. Monteith looked at uh, the production of a range of different species uh, in the UK. And when I take this as a starter and I uh, look what is the uh, increase in production when you increase the light by 10%, then you can calculate that the increase in production in productivity is 12%, right? So the daily light integral is really an, uh, a relevant issue for plant growth, as you would expect. Okay, now, so now we would like to see how we can uh, integrate uh, the knowledge that has been obtained, obtained and there has been obtained a lot of knowledge. Uh, there has been published many different experiments. You can go back more than 100 years when people did already the first experiment where they shaded uh, some plants and compared them with unshaded plants. And I think there must have been 1000 experiments uh, uh, at this time that have been published. So, and over time you see that people have focused on specific subfields. Some looked at photobiology, some looked at uh, chemistry, some looked at um, reproduction for example. And I'm looking for a way that we can integrate all these different experiments with all these different light levels that have been done and to come at something which is comparable where we can get a perspective on how plants uh, respond to their environments. But that's not easy. And just to give you an, uh, a feeling for that about what, uh, uh, what difficulties you can envisage, let's take two experiments. One experiment of investigator A, which looked at Arabidopsis, and uh, investigator, investigator A grew the plants at low and high light and measured the given traits and measured it at 20 units for at low light and 40 units at high light. And then we have another investigator, uh, B, and she grew uh, plants at low and high light and she measured the traits and she found that it was 30 and 60 units. And then you could say, okay, well, this is actually quite nice in line. There are differences uh, between uh, species in this case, because this was Arabidopsis and this was Brassica, but uh, they both doubled when uh, the light intensity went from low to high light. And so that's fine. But suppose now that investigator B had measured that both at low and at high light, the trait for pheno the phenotypic trait uh, Y was uh, 60 units. So now we have a problem. Uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to, to, to merge these uh, things? And yeah, well, there can be differences because these were two different species or there could be differences because uh, this species was grown in the growth chamber and this species was grown in a glass house. Um, so there are all kinds of uh, different uh, conditions. And the third explanation is that actually, uh, even in this case, it could be that these species are not different at all, which may seem a bit surprising in the beginning, but if you think about the fact that, uh, yeah, Arabidopsis is often grown at very low light intensities, whereas Brassica, being an agricultural species, is often grown at pretty high light intensities. So somebody working on Arabidopsis would never think 
of growing plants at a DLI of 30 or 40, but probably the agricultural interested person would never think of growing his uh, plants uh, at, at a DLI of five or 10. So it could not be excluded, or we could also say it may well be that actually both Arabidopsis uh, and uh, Brassica uh, would follow the same dose response curve and that we just measured them on the different parts of the dose response curve. Now, those response curves are of course not new. They are in, in fact uh, already uh, uh, invented uh, a long time ago by von Liebig and Michelich. And we are still measuring those response curves when we measure uh, photosynthesis light response curves or photosynthesis CO2 response curves. But for the rest, I have the feeling that in, uh, in plant biology, we are a little bit neglecting those response curves. And that is a shame because I think this is a very powerful way to summarize data. And that's what I'm going to try in the rest of my talk. So my dream is to synthesize data across well, basically these, these 1000 different experiments in a way that people that come from photobiology or come from uh, reproductive biology or uh, study chemical composition uh, could compare their own results and the results that other people have found by looking at those response curves and make it digestible in a way that is digestible for every biologist in one day, right? So how can you become experts in one day? That's the question. Okay, let's get an, uh, an example. Here you see um, the uh, results for my first efforts. And what I looked at was the specific leaf area. And the specific leaf area is the amount of leaf area that the plant makes per unit leaf dry mass, right? So the plant invests a certain amount of dry mass in its leaves and how much leaf area can it make with that given amount of, uh, of dry mass. And it is well known that a specific leaf area is changing a lot when you grow your plants at low light or at high light. Uh, so it's, uh, you make very thin leaves when uh, the light intensity is low. So you would expect a high specific leaf area here. And when you go to the high end, the high light end, you see that generally the specific leaf area is much lower. The leaves become much thicker. And well, if you have some fantasy, you can see that there is a negative relationship, but uh, there is uh, a problem here. Uh, we have compiled data for about 300 different uh, experiments where plants were grown at, at, uh, experimentally in different uh, uh, conditions with only uh, a difference in line intensity, not a difference in light quality or in nutrients or whatever, only a difference in light intensity. And these are about 500 species and about two and a half thousand mean values for each species in each experiment. And yeah, it doesn't give uh, a real clear picture. And one of the reasons for that is that you see here, the blue dots are for herbaceous plants and the red dots are for woolly species. And that gives already an indication that next to, of, uh, apart from the phenotypic, uh, variation, there's also genotypic variation that comes into play. These different species have a different, uh, uh, geno uh, yeah, have a different genome, have a different um, uh, phenotypic value of their specific uh, leaf area at basically any light intensity. And that makes that our view of the world is blurred. So how we can we go rid of that, that is an uh, interesting question. And one of the most simple things I could think of is say, okay, we take one given uh, level of the daily light integral. In this case, that's eight moles per square meter per day. And I look at this blue experiment with this herbaceous plant. And what I see is that there were uh, uh, six different um, mean values observed for the six different light intensities. And it happened that one of these experimental conditions was eight mole per square meter per day. And what I do, I take the value of that, which is 50, and I now normalize all the points by 50. So I divide every of these observations by 50. And uh, I'll do exactly the same with the red experiment. This was for a woolly species. And here you see there was not a really experiment at eight moles per square meter per day, but I can interpolate these two. I come at a value of say 25, I divide all these points by 25. 
And when I have both normalized, then you see a curve that looks like this. And now we have got rid of the genotypic differences, more or less, and we see that we now have the response, which looks much more similar than when you would look at the absolute values. Right? And when we do that for all the data here, then you see that you come at a much clearer picture where there may still be small differences between the woody and the herbaceous species in, in their uh, response, but uh, it looks much better than uh, it was before. And this is not so difficult to uh, come with a general uh, trends across all these points. So let's give it a try. And the first thing I do, trying to avoid any uh, equation to superimpose on this data, what I do is I uh, rank all the observations for all these different experiments based on the DLI that the plants received. And for every 10% of the uh, observations, I calculate a median value uh, for DLI and a median value for the SLA, right? So I have 10 groups and these uh, green squares are the average values for all the plants that are in this group of observations. And now you can see already that we have a quite nice dose response curve, which is pretty unbiased. It stops here because there are not so many data in, at high level and stops here because, well, the lowest data we can also not extrapolate. But we have a very nice idea over the, how the dose response curve runs for most, uh, the largest part of the, uh, the x-axis. And the interesting thing we can do here is that uh, next to the median value, we can also uh, calculate the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And we can, that's the blue line, we can calculate the 10th percentile and 90th percentile. So we now can get an indication about what is the normal range of, of, of values that we observe when we do this type of experiments. Right? So if we, if you would do an experiment and you, uh, it falls more or less within the brown line, then you have something which is very similar to uh, what most other people in the past have found. But if you would have a, uh, a line that starts here and uh, that uh, goes into this, this direction, and there are examples of that, uh, then clearly something is wrong. And, uh, or you have a species that is extremely dif different from all the other species. But most likely, uh, there will be a problem with your light meter or with your treatments. So it's good to know a bit about what is the, uh, the normal ranges that you can expect for your experiments. But in the end, of course, it's uh, still very nice to have an equation to fit the data with. So here I use this monomolecular equation with uh, three different uh, parameters to fit. And when I fit this, you see that it basically fits the green line quite nicely, except in the very end, because here you see that the, the points probably, uh, the specific leaf area increases a little bit stronger than this line uh, suggests. But okay, in the end, we have, in this way, explained 70% uh, of the information, of the variation that is in the data. And if you realize that these data come from, from woody and from herbaceous species and from glass houses and, uh, and from uh, growth chambers and from the field, uh, yeah, it's clear that uh, this equation has done a wonderful job. Okay, there's one more, one more thing that I would like to explain before I continue. That is, in the end, if you want to compare different curves, then it's difficult to compare that over this full range. So for your convenience, I've also uh, calculated what I call a plasticity index. And the plasticity index is uh, the ratio between the value of the fitted curve at one mole per square meter per day, so at a very low light intensity, which you would get uh, in the understory of a forest, for example, and a very high light intensity, uh, 50 moles per square meter per day, a value that would only be uh, reached in uh, uh, specific periods of the year in specific places where uh, there is not much cloud cover. So I calculate, you should be aware of that, I calculate the plasticity index not for the response of a given genotype, but across all the data that are in the database for all these 1500 species uh, for which I, uh, the specific leaf area was measured, right? And the ratio differs 2.4 
and because in this case it's negative, um, I uh, I thought I could uh, express it as point uh, two or so, but then it's difficult for you and me to compare these responses with positive responses. So rather than that, I uh, say okay, I I take the same, I, I take the the highest value over the lowest value, and I uh, uh, give it a minus sign. Hendrik, um, Sven yeah. speaking. Yeah. Um, we have one one um, question from the chat. Maybe I bring that one in because it seems to be quite specific. Yeah. Um, Ines asks um, about the point with less variation has a DLI equal eight question mark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very good. Could you maybe address that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, because at uh, this point here, there seems to be no variation. Of course, at eight moles, there is in principle a lot of variation, but this is the value that I use to, um, to normalize or to scale all the data. So around this point, it cannot be anything else than uh, the unity. And that's the reason why there is uh, uh, so much, so little variation at this point, right? And you see that here the variation is getting bigger the more you deviate from uh, from the eight. And well, here you see it, it's less clear, but um, uh, yeah, uh, that is the consequence of uh, scaling the data at a given byte intensity. Uh, yeah. There are other ways to solve this, but that makes life much more complicated from a statistical point of view. So, and that would it less, make it less easy to understand it. So that's the reason why I choose for um, this approach. Okay, yeah. thanks. There's another one from Ron um, who asked, how was the grouping done into 10 groups? Um, in brackets, maybe he had missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and let me see when I can go back. So the grouping is basically done. I have all these observations and I rank them for their DLI. And I take, uh, so the, the first one is say point, uh, point 0.1, and the next one is point 0.11, point 0.12. So these are very low values. And here they go from 35 to, to 70. And uh, I, I do the grouping just based on the rank order of these uh, DLI values. So every group is 10% of the data. And in this case, it's between 35 and, and, and 75. And here it will be between 10, 28 and 35. And in each of these blocks, there is an equal amount of data, right? Yeah. Thanks, Hendrik. Yeah. OK, good. So now you may think, and uh, yeah, but uh, we knew already that uh, specific leaf area is decreasing uh, with light. So is this really useful? And just to give you a um, feeling of how difficult it actually is to, to know these different trends, I'm going to pose a question to all of you. And I ask you, give a thought of about uh, 10, 15 seconds about how do you think that the chlorophyll content per unit area changes with the light intensity, right? And I give you three options. Uh, I, I don't ask about the specific form of the, the curve, but I just uh, give you three alternatives saying, well, uh, it decreases with DLI. And I give you a reason for that. It's logical because uh, light is the most limiting step for photosynthesis. So at low DLI, I expect the highest chlorophyll content per area. Or you could uh, reason it doesn't change with DLI. And that's also logical because uh, light absorptance also doesn't change with DLI. And we know that chlorophyll and uh, absorptance are very strongly related. So probably that's the reason why there is no change in DLI. Or the third alternative is it, uh, the chlorophyll content increases with DLI. And this is logical because, well, everybody can see that uh, high light leaves are more dark green than uh, uh, low light ground plants, uh, of leaves from low light ground plants. So I give you 10, 15 seconds. Uh, think about what you, and you are quite an uh, informed community. Uh, whether you think it's A, B, or C, and my suggestion is that you uh, put it in the chat and Philip will uh, count the numbers and we will see in the end what happens. And I can already tell you that uh, the, uh, the times that I ask this question, uh, generally the 
distribution was one third, one third, one third for each answer. So my expectations are high that you could uh, do better than that. And uh, but uh, let's see. So please enter this in the chat. And then I'll continue in 10 seconds. Yeah, Hendrik, while Philip, I guess, starts counting, there's one question coming in from Felix um, that I forward. Uh, why would you combine both woody and non-woody plants into one equation? Might it not make more sense to use two groups? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's very interesting to know whether um, woody and non-woody plants differ from each other. And uh, that is certainly something you uh, can do as a second step. And that's what I have done as a second step. But as a first step, I just take all the plants, the green plants in this analysis that have leaves, stems and roots. And at first I treat them uh, as, as one group. And only later on I see is there differentiation in the dose response curve between different groups. Right, so I begin with uh, take everything and then I try to break that down in specific subgroups. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Hendrik. Okay, good. Now, so um, uh, we sat together with a number of people and we said, wouldn't it not be cool if we would be able to analyze the response of plants uh, to light intensity? And uh, would it not be cool if we could do that for 100 different phenotypic traits? So um, you can read in the New Photologist of last year about uh, this paper, but I'll basically tell you the uh, gist of the story here. So we sat together and we talked about what are the most relevant phenotypic traits where which we think are important for plant performance. And we came up with, uh, uh, yeah, with 100 of them, which we could group in uh, four main groups. Uh, they relate to morphology, to chemical composition, to physiology, and to growth and reproduction. Right? So, for example, in morphology, you have the LMA or the SLA. That is one trait. It's the same thing. Uh, you could think of leaf thickness, uh, which you can also think of uh, internode length, for example, or the leaf size of individual leaves, or stem diameter, or stom stomatal density. And in the case of chemical composition, you could think of nitrogen or phosphorus or uh, soluble phenolics. Uh, and you can look at leaf, stem, and roots. And uh, you can look at the physiology of plants, the photosynthesis and the transpiration. And you can look at, at relative growth rate or biomass allocation or the number of seeds that is produced by one plant. So all these characteristics are based on individual plants, right? And uh, sometimes they are measured in plants that are growing in a kind of, mostly they're growing in pots, but sometimes they're growing in the field. And then um, it has to be something that we can relate back to individual plant performance. So measured on a specific leaf or uh, it's measured, uh, say, the harvest index. That could be something that you can trace back to uh, the plant performance of one individual plant. And if you do all these, um, uh, these hundreds uh, uh, variables, then it turns out that uh, 30 fall off because we couldn't, we're not able to collect enough information in the literature. But for the other 70, uh, we had a lot. And basically, this is an overview of what we found. And you don't need to uh, look at this graph at all, except that you see that uh, you can see that some variables go up and some variables go down. And you see here the plasticity index, so the ratio over the, the range 1 to 50 uh, moles of light uh, per square meter per day. Now, this is just to give you a feel for the results, but to, uh, we have uh, for every individual trait, we have all the data for the woody species, for the herbaceous species. We know the 10 points of the, the 10 groups that I explained to you, but we also uh, know what the, the curve is. That's this brown one, for example. And we have all kinds of data about how many observations there are for how many species and was the fit linear or was, was the quadratic and what was the plasticity index and was the plasticity index the same for the basic species and was it for woody species, right? So you get all kinds of information and the fitted curve that in the end summarizes data is given by the, the three uh, parameter values that you see here. Now, it's still 
would, we wouldn't have the time to go through all these uh, data, but let's have a look at uh, an, a small selection to give you a feel. So this is now the plasticity index. And if you look at the number of seeds that are produced per plant for uh, plants grown at uh, one or grown at 50 moles of light per square meter per day, we see that the difference in seed production is more than 50. I have no time to explain you why it's not an exact number, but it's pretty large. Um, uh, when we look at photosynthesis and the growth light conditions, right? So low light for low light grown plants and high light for high light grown plants. And we see that the 50 fold difference in light intensity scales back to a 17 uh, point fold difference in photosynthesis. And when we look at uh, the soluble phenolic concentration in the leaf per unit mass, then we see that there is a 3.4 fold difference between the high light grown plants and the low light grown plants. In all these cases, the high light grown plants have higher values than the low light grown plants. Then there is a group of difference where uh, you see that basically hardly anything is happening. So the plasticity index is close to one or close to minus one. And that happens, for example, for the carbon concentration of the leaf or the pre water potential of the organic nitrogen concentration of the leaf. So light doesn't affect overall over these um, uh, 500 species or more that we measured, light does affect the nitrogen concentration of the leaf uh, or the water potential. And then we have a number of traits which uh, are strongly negatively affected by light intensity. So if you look at the chlorophyll to nitrogen ratio, for example, so how much chlorophyll is, is invested in the leaf relative to the total amount of nitrogen in the leaf, then you see that clearly if uh, plants go to a higher light intensity, they make relatively less chlorophyll uh, and they invest probably more in other nitrogen compounds. Okay, this is one way to look at the data, but there is something more. And the other- Hendrik, can I shortly jump in? Yeah. Um, we've got officially another 10 minutes left to go. Um, I think from an organizational part of view, we can obviously do longer. I just wanted to make sure that people that will have to leave at the um, find a chance to, to go in a discussion with you. Yeah. Um, so if you find a break somewhere in the next five minutes and we can just squeeze in a short discussion round if needed, I guess that would be great. Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. So you do not only look at what is the, uh, the magnitude of the response, but you can also look what is the consistency. So out of all these experiments that are in the database, which Wookler looked at high light and low light, and how many percent of the cases did plants with high lights uh, had more uh, seeds? And that happened to be in 96% of the cases. So that's very highly consistent. And when you look at uh, the chlorophyll to nitrogen ratio, for example, you see that um, when you look at high light compared to low light, only in 4% of the cases, um, the chlorophyll to nitrogen ratio is higher for the high light grown plants. So in 96% of the cases, it's lower. So that's also a very consistent observation. But when you look at the uh, water potential pre-dawn, you see that in this case, 50% of the cases, it was an increase. 50% of the cases was a decrease. So in that case, there was really not a strong, uh, uh, yeah, there is, the, it's not a consistent uh, thing. And interestingly, for example, if you look at the carbon concentration, you see the carbon concentration doesn't change that much, but still it's pretty consistent because in 85% of the cases, High light leaves have a higher carbon concentration per unit mass than uh, low light uh, grown leaves. So that's another aspect of um, this uh, thing. And then the third aspect is that in some cases you have uh, variables that have been measured very often and they are often related to leaves when you look at plants grown at low and high light. And in other cases you have variables where we don't have that much information. So this is something you have to weigh in as well. And you have to weigh in how many different species, uh, for how many different species was this measured. And so the, the third aspect is the reliability, where you say, is the dose response curve I came with, is it highly reliable? Well, in the case of Gardner, for example, yes, it's highly reliable. It, we know it about a wide range of, of light intensities with many different uh, observations. In the case of soluble phenolics, for example, the data were very scarce. So yes, we have an estimate, but don't take that estimate as serious as, for example, that of the carbon concentration. Okay, now then uh, we can uh, uh, try to bring this together in uh, what I would call a knowledge graph. And this knowledge graph basically tells you 
Okay, um, we know that uh, what is the effect of plants, uh, of light on plants, is first that they make thicker leaves, and these thicker leaves have per unit area more enzymes, more photostatic machinery, so they will uh, make a higher, they, they are able to have a higher rate of photosynthesis under saturating light and also under growth light conditions. And that means that they have a fast growth per uh, uh, growth rate per unit leaf area per time. And that means they have a high growth rates and uh, a high biomass. And that in the end will mean that they have a large number of seeds and fruits to produce. And all these arrows here, indicate the, that in the dose response curves, we found that there is an increase with light. Uh, so either in a very uh, small way, if you see a, a small arrow, and a very strong, if you see a very thick arrow, as in the graph I showed you. And now Sven is pushing me a little bit, so I'll go pretty quickly. Uh, so what happens here, you see plants have a higher light intensity have uh, thicker leaves, and they not only have thicker leaves, they have a higher proportion of mesophyll uh, relative to the whole uh, volume of the leaf, and they also have a higher proportion of palisade parenchyma relative to, to the whole mesophyll. That's what you see here. And this all leads to a uh, higher uh, uh, mesophyll area exposed to intercellular spaces relative to the total leaf area of the plants, which basically doubles. And it leads to a higher leaf mass per area, which basically uh, increases by 2.6. And then when we look at the, uh, the chemical composition, you see that uh, the leaf doubles not only in the A mass over A, but also in the nitrogen concentration per area, but not, and here you have the answer to the question, it definitely doesn't change at all the chlorophyll uh, content per unit area. And that's the reason that the chlorophyll to nitrogen ratio and decreases when you uh, increase light intensity. Now at the other side, the highlight level, you see that uh, uh, there is the concentration of soluble phenolics, which uh, may be very helpful to screen UVB light. And there is also um, in the xanthophyll uh, pigments from the xanthophyll cycle, they also strongly increase and they may also help to um, uh, make sure that at high light plants are not too uh, stressed. Okay, then you can go to the uh, things related to photosynthesis. And what you see here is that uh, the absorptance is not affected, like chlorophyll per unit area was not affected, but reflectance increases when plants are grown at high light. And what you see that the, F, uh, the Fe over Fm measured during the day is uh, somewhat decreasing. And at the same time, you see that photosynthesis per unit area uh, is increasing. This is uh, at saturating light. But if you express it per unit mass, you see there is no difference. And if you look at the photosynthesis per unit area at growth light conditions, you see this 70 fold increase with a 50 fold increase in light intensity. Now, then we have things related to uh, the water relations, the stomatal density, stomatal conductance. Uh, we have things related to the growth parameters of the plants. So uh, you see that the unit leaf rate is strongly increasing. Plants at high light make uh, relatively more roots because they have to, uh, to get more nutrients and water to keep up with the high activity of the leaves. And in the end, it results in a relative growth rate, which is increased, but not as much as the unit leaf rate. So there is a 2.7 fold increase in light intensity over that 50 fold range. And it ends with a total dry mass, as we have seen, with, uh, which has a plasticity index of 10, right? So there's uh, on average in all these experiments, there's a 10 fold difference in dry mass between the high light grown plants and the low light grown plants. And that results in the end, when you look how does the plant look like, it has more or less the same plant heights over uh, all light intensities but the specific stem length is very different. Uh, the internode length is much higher at low light and plants at uh, high light have, uh, sorry, the internode length is much higher at low light and the number of branches or the number of tillers is much higher at low light intensity. And that means that the harvest index or the reproductive effort increases a bit, individual seed mass increases a bit, but uh, the large gain you have is in the total number of seeds and fruits because basically 
the high light chrome plants are much bigger than the low light chrome plants. Now, these are conclusions that uh, I skip for the moment. And I just want to make you aware of the fact that we now have looked at one uh, environmental factor, light, uh, and many different traits. But you could do, of course, the same thing by looking at uh, other different factors. And in this case, I give you the example of SLA. Now we looked at these 12 abiotic environmental factors and we looked how are these dose response curves when we scale each of these uh, responses to a given value of that environmental factor. And then you see those response curves. And here you see that in this case, we've already seen uh, uh, light is a very strongly factor that affects LMA. Temperature does it, but in the opposite way. So the higher the temperature, the higher the SLA. And submergence is a strong factor. And basically all the others do not change that much. So to conclude, um, I think in this way, we can uh, unlock uh, more than 100 years of research where we are able to put all these data on these dose response curve. And in this way, we are able to make a kind of periodic table of plant responses, if you like, that uh, give an integrated perspective on how plants acclimate to their uh, light and to their environments. And yes, Felix, we can also follow that up by looking at uh, contrast between different plant groups, but no time today. So these are the people that I should uh, thank. And uh, I think uh, I can take questions for the first part. And then I would like to continue after that with asking you a few questions, given what uh, we have done here with this exercise on metaphonomics. Sven. Yeah, fantastic, Hendrik. Thank, thank you very much. Um, very, very enlightening, a very great presentation. Um, I would just like to encourage the audience just to paste um, questions into the chat if there are any. Um, secondly, from the organizational point of view, we just decided we just keep on rolling and um, stay here as long as it takes <laughs> in terms of the questions. And Hendrik, if you have more to show, then we can do it as well afterwards, obviously. Yeah. Um, and thirdly, I'm going to just feed back to you, Hendrik, the result of our survey, yeah. um, which is a little bit out of line of what you had predicted. Okay. Um, we That's have... Experts, huh? In the audience. Yes. And we have um, for A, 26%. Um, the same goes for answer C, and the answer B has 48% response. Look, so well done, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so Very 50%, good. 50% was right and 50% was wrong. <laughs> it's really better than most of the audiences I have uh, talked to so far. Yeah, that's a congratulations towards the audience, I guess. Um, so we are just um, yeah, having an, an eye on the chat. Um, if any questions come in, um, you already did answer several ones during the talk, Hendrik. So maybe you just um, already answered the most pressing aspects that were out there. I cannot start my video, uh, Sven. Yeah, it's, yeah. It says that you, you muted me. I can hear you, Hendrik. Yeah, yeah, but I cannot start a video. Uh, so I, you cannot see me, but okay, that's fine. Right. But okay, um, there are not any questions coming up. So you just move on then, Hendrik, for video. Okay, good. Yeah. So oh, Sorry, Hendrik, there's one coming in. Okay. Uh, maybe we take that one first um, from Felix who says you often talked about high and low light levels. Would you divide these further? Because especially some plants show unusual responses, for example, growing in very PPFD environments. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And that, that relates, I think, to, um, we know that some species are typical shade species, right? That's uh, generally occur in, um, in environments that are very shaded, whereas you uh, will have others like sunflower, which generally occur in very high light uh, conditions. And uh, yeah, the question is, do they have different dose response curves? And we looked at that and actually the surprising thing is we could find a little bit of a difference, but actually it is for many species, uh, uh, especially highlight species are able to grow uh, in very low lights conditions, 
So um, they can grow in, in, in two or one mole per square meter per day, uh, almost as good as shade species can do. Uh, the only thing is that they are more vulnerable to, uh, to, to pests or to, uh, ab to, to bio biotic factors. And that's probably why you will not find them in the field. But in the growth chamber, we have not been able to see a lot of a difference between uh, these groups. So yeah, there, there are some uh, minor differences, but uh, basically many plants can grow well at low lights and uh, most plants can also grow at relatively high light. So um, uh, yeah, what high light and low light is, is different when you grow them in the field, but the, the inherent capabilities of the plants are more similar than I first thought they were. Okay. Um, Max comes up for a question asking if light stress is increased, will chlorophyll levels go down eventually? I think so. Yeah. You see these, uh, these very bleached leaves when you have extremely high light intensities. Uh, but um, yeah, but, but yeah. Okay. Um, on average, uh, that didn't show up in our data. Right. Um, Ron asks, what fraction of the data roughly comes tropic versus temperate? Reason being, is light, for instance, a less important limiting factor than, say, temperature in the tropics? And so the strength of these, does the response may differ? Yeah, so actually what Ron asks is, uh, is there a strong uh, interaction with temperatures? Or is there a light by temperature interaction for these data? Um, when you look at the fraction of species, so about half the species is um, woody species and half of them are herbaceous species. And of the woody species, I guess that many of them are uh, actually from the tropics because uh, there are so many species there and people have done a lot of research looking at the effect of light intensity. So yes, there will be a lot of species from the tropics and will they do different depending on uh, temperature? So. I cannot fully answer that. I, I can give two answers. The first answer is uh, for this analysis, I have, if people have measured them at different temperatures, I took only the measurements for the optimal temperature. So for the temperature where the plants were growing best and I discarded all the rest. And it's the same with plants grown at low nutrients and, and, and low water. I discarded all those treatments. I only looked at the optimal treatment as far as, it, uh, as people had done different treatments. Uh, so in that case, I only look at one uh, factor independent of the other factors. But in the end, what you would like to, to have is not a dose response curve, but a dose response surface where you look at uh, light in one direction and, for example, temperature in the other direction. And it would be very interesting to see how the dose response surface looks like. Uh, but that requires a lot of data before, before you're able to really fit such uh, a plane. And yeah. So far, we haven't been able to do that. But it's a very interesting question. Okay, great. One further one. One influence does biome of origin does play? Have you tried putting them into groups of biogeographical origin? Uh, yes, we have been doing that as well. In fact, we, um, uh, we have looked at uh, a range of different ecological uh, parameters. And uh, Uloninimes has rated these plants for their location uh, on, on difference on the light and temperature and nutrient axis. And uh, we have been looking at uh, different phylogeny and we have been looking at uh, different uh, biomes. And mostly, the, mo the most amazing thing was actually that most of these plants actually are quite similar in the dose response curve rather than that they are very different. Now you have to remember, we look here only at uh, proportional responses. And so it could be if we look at absolute values, that then there are strong differences between uh, groups from different biomes. That's what I would expect. But in the relative responses, these differences are pretty small. Okay, thanks. Um, Carlos asks, does the interaction between PPFD levels and temperature across different environments will drastically change the PI values of any given trait? Or should we expect similar trends across temperature gradients? Um, well, that that of course depends how uh, strong you go out of the out of the, the, the limits uh, out of the range that a plant normally uh, behaves happy. So if you go 
at three degrees and we then look at the dose response curves, it uh, will definitely look different from when you look at plants grown at 20 degrees or 25 degrees. But again, uh, I think if you are not going to such an extreme, I think the dose response curves, the proportional values look actually pretty similar. So I don't expect that these dose response surfaces are uh, really um, show a strong optimum. I expect that they are over a broad range. They are pretty similar. Okay. Um, Felix asks you, have you also included the factor of spectrum into your data to normalize it? Or do you have so much data that it is not so essential? Right, so uh, um, I have, we have been looking at uh, spectrum. Uh, let me see whether, look, we have here at, uh, we have looked at the red to farad ratio because that is uh, in nature the most uh, relevant uh, thing to do. Uh, and you see that for a trait like specific leaf area, for example, it turned out that there was no effect of the red to farad ratio at all, even while plants growing in the shade generally have a much uh, a lower red to farad ratio than plants that are growing at high light, but uh, red to farad ratio has no effect uh, on specific leaf area per se. And for the effect of light, we have been uh, looking only at uh, people that uh, uh, gave more or less light from the same lens or when they shaded with neutral shading cloth. So where they did not affect the red to farad ratio, but only the light intensity was an, uh, a relevant factor. So this is really independent of light quality and light quality is really, as far as possible, uh, independent of the light intensity. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Miriam asks, what is your opinion on field fluorimeters used in fluctuating field conditions? Um, and she goes on saying any potential use for me, and I think that breaks off. So Miriam is, uh, if uh, Hendrik is now not fully answering a question, please feed in the full sentence um, as an addition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that means uh, measuring fluorescence, I, I think, or measuring, uh, that, that's I think what the question is, right? Um, yeah. Metaphenomics. Okay, I trust any potential use for metaphenomics. This is the question from you. Oh, uh, potential fit. Um, I, I, think, um, I think this is uh, specifically focusing on the effect of the environment. And um, uh, in that sense, if you, um, so it, here you can understand what is the effect uh, of, of light on the phenotype of the plants. Uh, what consequence has that if you do uh, field experiments? Um, I think uh, uh, it gives you a background. Um, it uh, depends a little bit on the um, genotype by environment interaction, right? How plants will really respond in the field. So um, if you're interested in comparing different genotypes, then the G by E interaction is, is pretty important. Uh, and I do not, yeah, uh, given what I see, from these different species, I would expect that uh, uh, generally the G by E interaction is quite similar for different genotypes of a given species, but that will not always be the case. So yeah, what is the relevance? I think you understand your plants better if you know how they uh, adjust themselves and how they are in, in, in March or April compared to how they are in, in July. Uh, but you still have to go in the field to do the measurements for those plants, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's one further question from Surya asking, is there interaction with UVB? Um, good question. I know that there is an interaction uh, of light with UVB in the sense that uh, the UVB radiation has no, not such a strong impact on plants uh, if the, uh, the, the daily light integral is high and it has a uh, much more negative impact on plants if the light intensity where the plants are growing is low, right? So if you have a, a low light intensity and you give plants then a lot of UVB, then um, they will be more harmed than when they have already a high level of, uh, of light as a background. So in that sense, I know there is an interaction 
uh, I expect that there is a cross uh, reaction as well in the sense that UVB affects the DLI response. But even uh, remember the uh, whoop. Remember now I yeah. Look at the uh, soluble phenolics. Here the plants were grown at the same UVB level, and still you see that high light by itself is, uh, is increasing the concentration of soluble phenolics, which uh, are used as a screen for, with, uh, a screen for UVB in the uh, upper part of the, um, uh, the epidermis. So, uh, and that's the same what you see. Generally, light quality, for example, is changing plants a lot, but uh, if you only decrease the line intensity and you uh, keep the red to violet ratio the same, then you will still see the, the typical shade responses that plants perform. So I think uh, uh, triggers like UVB and uh, light quality uh, make that plants respond somewhat more quickly than uh, they will do otherwise. But uh, even, even so, if you keep the UVB and the red to violet ratio constant, constant, you still see shade acclimation responses and you still see responses to high light, right? So I think the, the network that underlies these responses uh, is yes, triggered by uh, light quality, but it's also triggered by uh, light intensity. Okay, thanks for that, Hendrik, perfect. Um, you covered the last question we have in the chat, at least I think so. If you missed something, please, um, from the audience, just feed it into the chat again. Um, Hendrik, in terms of providing kind of a framework for the audience, we just wondered if you should go on until 3.30 and then stop it. Would that yeah. be fine for you? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah? Great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll lead over to you again, Hendrik, then. Yeah. So actually, um, um, I would now actually like uh, pose you as audience the questions or to, to, to have a kind of discussion more than that I answer questions of you. Uh, which relates to the analysis I did uh, about the acclimation of plants and uh, keeping in mind that what you are often doing is looking at uh, adaptation or look at, at, at least at genotypic differences. And so I have four different questions which I would bring in as uh, discussion questions. And first of is, uh, okay, we, uh, we know that there are many uh, relevant traits. Uh, we have been looking at 100 different traits um, how many traits do we actually need to, to measure and characterize and also uh, to understand the phenome of the plants, right? So what is the number that we need to say, okay, now we have studied our plants and we understand why they grow as they grow? That would be my first question. And then the second question is, uh, you know that uh, many, many of us are uh, phenotyping with uh, non-destructive measurements. So we look at uh, imaging at all kinds of different wavelengths. Um, and uh, my question that I have, are we able to capture enough of the phenome by watching the plant? So by doing these non-destructive measurements. And just as a reminder, you see here, the fluorescence, uh, so the Fe over Fm that we measured, which is often measured as a non-destructive way to characterize something related to photosynthesis. But you see at the same time that the photosynthesis per unit area is increasing dramatically, whereas the, the quantum yields, the maximum quantum yield of plants is decreasing when they are grown at, at high light. Right? So, are we capturing enough of the phenome by just watching the plants, by doing these non-destructive measurements, or should we uh, change things also in a way that we also uh, measure what is internally, uh, say the, the nitrogen and starch concentration of the plants, or measure really photosynthesis? Then the third question I have is uh, what I see that we are doing in these phenomic facilities is that we, because we are measuring non-destructively uh, and because basically repeating the measurements is, uh, comes at a relatively low cost, we measure uh, uh, quite frequently, uh, which gives us a lot of data. And sometimes you can see that people are, uh, you know, it's difficult to keep on top of all these data. And is that always necessary? 
well, here in this case, there was an experiment where people put a, a novel at all, they put a digestate patch in a, a, a riser box frame and they followed the route over time. And you see that uh, 60 days after they put in the plants, the plants avoid the digestate patch uh, as far as they can. But uh, after 90 days, you see that now suddenly it's highly red here. That means there are a lot of roots here. So in this case, they jump after 90 days, they jump on this patch and they digest it because apparently all the nasty chemicals that were here in the beginning have disappeared. But quite often, uh, we don't have such a specific uh, time difference. So would it not be better to uh, measure less frequently or maybe only at the end of the um, uh, experiments and then measure uh, something else as well. So that's my third question. And then the fourth question is also a classical one and relates uh, to what you brought up already about the environment. Uh, all these responses uh, of all these different environments have an effect on the plants. Uh, often we measure in, in growth chambers or in glass houses. Uh, others measure in the fields. In how many environments should we anyway characterize the phenol? These are the questions I had. So, yeah, it would be fun if I would hear from you as an audience what your perspective on these things is. Okay, so um, please provide your input towards Hendrik <laughs> into the chat again, and we will just. Um... Maybe we can open the. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now? Philip just suggested as well. Um, if you want to say something, um, announce in the chat, and then we will grant you audio. That's maybe the better one. Yeah. Um, in the meanwhile, Hendrik, there has been one person coming back um, asking about this answer B of your survey, if this was right. <laughs> so if the kind of the group answer was um, with the 48 percent, um, if that fitted. Yeah, if you look at it, uh, you can uh, more closely at the chlorophyll content per unit area and how it responds to light. Uh, I could see a small difference between um, woody species and herbaceous species. And if I remember that well, um, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, there was a small decrease uh, with the in the chlorophyll to uh, content per unit area for the woolly species and a small increase for herbaceous species. So uh, it may not be completely zero for all species, but on average, when you look at, at all these plants, they're basically uh, the, the leaf mass per area increases. So there's a lot thicker leaf with a lot more nitrogen but uh, not with more chlorophyll. Okay, great. In the meanwhile, we have um, we have a answer towards question one from Felix. Felix, can you speak out? Uh, yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Yes, it works. Uh, I had a question about the first one actually because I think it kind of depends on what would you like to phenotype because it crop like, I don't know, maize, where uh, at the end mostly the biomass is important is completely different from second metabolite crops where often the pure weight is not important but the metabolites get a whole different complexity level in it. And to get to that result also you need then different characteristics to measure basically. Right, now, now I'm not going to give an answer because I think we would be interested to see what other people in the group think about that. Okay, thanks Felix so far. So we see if somebody else will come up with some ideas, statements, answers. So, not really any further comments so far. Then what is your perspective, Sven? 
Oh, don't ask me, please. <laughs> I guess experience-wise, I'm the least person to give an answer to your question. <laughs> So I would I would generally uh, agree to what Felix uh, said um, if I understood it uh, right. So it depends. I mean, there are there are a bunch of different species out there on the planet, and of course they don't compare in any uh, in 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 all respects. Um, so there are ones uh, with a with a more complex. Uh, um, <clears throat> which are more complex organisms. Uh, other ones are quite easy and straightforward in their, um, what they are doing in their physiology and in their physiological uh, response to environment. So until we do not know exactly everything about each species, it uh, is of course very, very hard to judge what um, is to be measured to understand the growth of, of a respective species completely. Right, I, I agree with it, uh, Philip, uh, and, and I agree with Felix as well. It depends, of course, on your question, but yeah, if you think, I mean, we could easily think of 100 different phenotypic traits which are relevant for plant functioning, and that's by, by no means at the end. Uh, I think if you, if you would think, sit together, we could come up with 200 different traits which are relevant. Uh, and if you see in, in, in these phenotyping systems, uh, often we measure, uh, say, two, three, or maybe four. And there can be highly relevant ones, like, for example, what's the digital biomass of these uh, plants? But yeah, the question is, is this enough to understand your plants, or should we actually do, uh, uh, yeah, should we do better? So we have another input coming up from Ron on question one. Um, can somebody grant Ron? Um, yes, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, no. perfect, Ron. Hello. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, first off, Hedrick, brilliant talk. I think uh, I, it was very enlightening overall. Um, and I, I'm a PhD student in forest ecology, so it might come off slightly from a different perspective here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but. Uh, I find it interesting because, you know, uh, often at times we're trying at least, uh, say for instance, questions like what uh, determines the structure of a forest? Why are species distributed in a certain manner and not in certain other manner? Uh, oftentimes to understand questions like this, it's important to, uh, this, this whole idea of trait ecology has become very useful, where you can just like measure certain, uh, a single trait for all of these species and these traits can be very informative about the mechanisms that these different species have uh, that they use uh, to, to come about and distribute themselves in the forest, right? Uh, and in that perspective, it's very nice when you have a few brilliant traits who can tell you a lot about the species. Um, and uh, I think in that, from that perspective, uh, this question actually holds uh, a, a key importance because you can't just go on with a laundry list of traits uh, uh, species um, uh, and so when when uh, things like Viol did, uh, there is this paper where uh, she's pooling together all of these traits and generating a PCA of sorts, where they have these uh, axes, pre, a key key principal component axes that can explain different strategies, uh, different spectrums, so to speak. You know, uh, fast, slow growth, uh, things of that sort. So, so when you have some trait that can capture one spectrum, uh, the job is done. You don't need 50 other traits that give you the same redundant information. Uh, so at least in my head, I go about it that way when I try to minimize the trait list to a few such that if uh, SLA is correlated with 50 other traits and gives the same information, I would, min I would drop all the other traits and just pick SLA because it captures variation. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's one way I think about this. Uh, but yeah, yeah. But this is nice because it gives this idea of trait hierarchy and there's more to it than just one trait. Uh, there's more to it than just S SLA, a lot of other things determine SLA. So that's a, yeah, I, I, I don't know if, uh, yeah, that helps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously you cannot measure, I mean, it, in, in this way, what we did is basically uh, getting all these different sub-disciplines together, but it, 
I agree with you, it's impossible to measure uh, 100 or 150 traits on one plant uh, uh, simultaneously. But on the other hand, I mean, yeah, you have to understand the water relations, you have to understand the carbon relations, you have to understand the nutrient relations of a plant. So uh, the plant has to bring this all in line and it has to do this in the roots, it has to do it in the shoots. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there, there is a certain minimum that you need to, to get a nice understanding of what the plant is doing. And in ecology, we are already happy when we explain 10 or 15 percent of the variation, right, uh, worldwide. Uh, if you look at these phenotyping uh, machines that uh, are, are very big and automated, uh, uh, we aim, of course, to, for, for a much better understanding and we aim for for more than 15% of the variation, maybe 95%. But I've, I've never seen a discussion about what should we do to really, uh, yeah, what, 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 what's the short list of traits that we should measure to come at this 95% of, of variation explained. Thanks, Aron. Um, we have a Roland raising his hand. Um, Roland, do you want to talk? Uh, yes, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Hendrik, for the nice presentation. So, so uh, basically, to question one, how many phenotypic traits do we do we need? And I would agree also with the first uh, other comments that it depends. And at another aspect, also it depends not only on the phenotype, what phenotype you want to measure, but it also depends on the environment. Because depending on the environment, you focus on different traits. So it's not uh, that simple how many phenotypes, but it's also which phenotypes are relevant under which environmental conditions, just to add another aspect. Hendrik, you've, you've got some direct response to that one, or you just want to leave it hanging in the air? And um... <laughs> I, was, I was nodding um, to Roland's answer and uh, waiting for others to uh, Join in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Indeed. <clears throat> the the uh, physio uh, physiology of, of species is a terribly ex uh, um, complex thing. Yeah, and I think this is also what what all the the um, other comments more or less did say. I just um, got reminded of each time I, I did a principal component analysis and I thought I had all the relevant uh, factors included, but uh, was still giving me just like a 15% primary axis, yeah, which, which just showed that it's just all my variables um, explained for only 15% of the, of the um, variation in my data set. So there must have been 85% of, of things that I did not take into account. Um, and this, this happened, of course, I think with many of us more than, more than one time. I think uh, um, a valid approach um, should to to reduce this kind of complexity is coming also from from your question and um from all the inter uh, links with also other species with the environment with the hydrology with maybe uh, pollutants um, the human and whatsoever so if we can come up with a hierarchical approach um trying to to sequentially narrowed down to um, the, the, the complex, this complexity to just a few factors, then we are getting somewhere. But I think this process is um, all about what science is, right? I mean, you try to understand, you try to narrow down, you try to, um, yeah, do exactly this and then end up with 15% primary access in your PCA still. <laughs> that just shows that we still do not know enough for, for maybe um, making this uh, kind of approach is 100% uh, fit. Yeah, but Philip, uh, on the one hand, I fully agree with you. On the other hand, I think, okay, we have now been doing, as, as a phenotyping community, we have been doing experiments for 100 years. And um, uh, we are in the systems biology uh, era now. So we should be able to do better than 15%. We uh, should be able to, to jump to the 85%. We have so many capabilities in, in measuring um, devices. 
we have so much uh, clever researchers. So yeah, I, I would like to push uh, for uh, stronger aims or to, to say more far-fetched aim. I would like to be able to understand the phenome. And uh, yeah, I, I would, I mean, it would be sad if we, um, uh, in, in say five or 10 years would not be at, uh, at a much higher level than we are now. And we have Ron who had who did paste a link into the chat towards a nature paper. So for all uh, everybody interested, just make use of that link, please. Um, we have further Alex and uh, Felix and Roland raising their hand, and um, as we have about fifty experts in the audience, so just feel free to bring in your expertise to the group um, if you want to. Um, Felix, um, yes. you want to raise your voice again? Um, well. I'm neither an expert on phenotyping or modeling, but from my time in the university when I need to work on a paper for how do we implement genotype in plant models, usually you always talk about the level of what you want to actually model. So I guess for a phenotype, it's also important what should be your end result because you can only go so far higher on the plant level and lower on the plant level. So if you want to know a bit more about the topology phenotype, you can't really measure on a microscopic level plant processes. Often times you can't really correlate that well. And on the other hand, if you want to really do basic metabolic phenotyping, then you can't start with larger traits, I would say. Yeah. Great. Um, Roland, you want to answer to that one or you have another specific point? Yeah, I just forgot to lower my hand, but I can still ask a question. So basically bring another perspective in, 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 in a sense of uh, how many phenotypic traits. Uh, so talking from the perspective of the breeder, it's in the end, it would be just uh, three, yield, yield and yield. Uh, so, so it's again the, the perspective of the um, yeah, of the user, of, of the person who is doing that. I, I don't know if there is anyone from the audience uh, from uh, having this uh, breeder perspective and could potentially comment on that. Thank you. Okay, right. Um, so this has been a, a fantastic um, presentation from you, Hendrik, and a very fantastic um, discussion as well. So we, are, we have a tendency to close it here now after about 35 minutes running late, um, except for if somebody has some very pressing point. Um, okay, I have one last one from Surya towards question three. I think we're going to take this one as last one, don't we? Surya, you want to speak up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, great. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I think uh, this gives like a broad view of the phenome, like how we can look from a different perspective. But uh, this question number three, this part of the thing I'm doing uh, myself as well. And I, I was always debating like how frequent should I measure the trades or should I look for a different components? Uh, for me, I'm thinking like if we look at different types of measurement, we are looking uh, like a different uh, perspective uh, of the phenotypes. So that might give a pretty different um, view of how the phenotype expresses or something like that. So I, I think uh, having a more types of measurement is uh, really a useful idea. Um, but obviously it depends on how the development goes with time uh, in terms of measuring uh, frequently. So well, probably the finding the balance, but incorporating more types of measurement is always beneficial. Um, I, I want to hear from you as well of what you think about this. Well, I, I think first it depends uh, partly of course on the environment you're working in. So in the growth chamber, not so much will happen as when you um, uh, work in the field or in the glasshouse where the environments might be more variable. And 
that probably would also mean that you uh, uh, want to measure more frequently. But yeah, I, I'm thinking, for example, you can measure, uh, you can follow the, the, the root development in these riser boxes uh, every week, for example, and see how far the roots are going. But, and that comes at, at, at very high costs, but you could also say, okay, at the end of the experiments, I um, uh, really look at the root distribution at this, as this at that moment in time. And then most likely you have already captured 90% um, uh, of what you want to know. So for me in that case, um, I, I'd rather would have known the, uh, say the, the, the water potential or the photosynthesis of those plants next to the, the roots distribution. So that was a bit the motivation of my question. So I, I agree with you, it depends a bit on, it of course depends on the experiment you have, but mm -hmm. it's more motivation to think, should I really, I can do it, but should I always do it? Or uh, does it really bring me enough additional information or should I do maybe um, uh, and other measurements rather than six times the root distribution. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Hendrik. Um, thank you to all of the audience. So we are still about 50 people here in that round. <laughs> so running more than almost 40 minutes late. So, um, so thanks to all of you out there um, participating directly, listening, bringing in your view in the chat. Um, this has been a very promising and a very lovely start to this webinar series. Um, we just would like to encourage you just to bring in your topics, um, to um, submit an abstract to that one, to participate in further meetings, just make use of that platform. Um, I've seen that, um, in the list there are people basically all across the world in this very round here, which is a very nice um, experience. Um, I would like to take the chance again to thank Hendrik Porter for, his provide, for, his, for him providing insight into his expertise and into his work. Um, I would like to thank many people that are, have been working in the background. Um, I would like to specifically thank to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, in person, Jennifer Clark, who has been sitting here all the time um, without raising her voice, but doing a lot of work um, in setting this one up. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, and hopefully meet you again then the next time in two weeks. Um, again, 14 o'clock CEST, this time with a um, event and talk by Uli Schur. Um, let, feel free to let us know um, via the homepage and information we have there uh, and the feedback loop to let us know what you think about the seminar, if you like it or not. And otherwise, just all the best for you out there. 